it's really uh, quite early in the morning and it's very quiet. <laughs> Pop the top off of this HP power supply and just show you what's going on inside. I've had time to tinker with about four of these. These things are so heavy and so unmanageable, it's uh, really kind of a pain in the butt. And today is a new twist has been added to the mix which is the uh, temperature really dropped last night I thought I uh, seen today that it was like 10 below with the wind chill it's getting down there I'm not a big winter person it just really gets a cramp in my style whatever that may be There we go. Now this is this is the top side. And I don't know if you can see this really well. Now here's the power transformer. Actually there are two transformers in this. And this is the cat bank. These are all in parallel with a big pair of buses and some kind of clever bracketing those are actually like little pieces of L shaped aluminum that have drilled a hole right in the center they just use that to suck that down and there actually are two other caps underneath there This, uh, this particular supply has what they call a pre-regulator. Um, it's actually a tracking pre-regulator. What it does is, um, since this can go to like a volt or less at 50 amp, you got to uh, get rid of the heat somewhere. And instead of dumping it all on the actual regulator, they've got a kind of a more crude pre-regulator that does some brute force work and the heat's actually dissipated under this board. I don't know if you can see this or not. Right here there actually is a tunnel. It's made up of four heat sinks where the fins are all uh, they're all facing in and there's a pretty high power fan on this end that blows down through that tunnel. It's a pretty clever way to dissipate the heat. All the control stuff is right here. Actually, there's this piece of sheet metal steel behind this faceplate to kind of isolate it. This thing is pretty much, not very tight, but reasonably well sealed up as far as electronically. And all the, uh, well, Switch gears here. We get the, uh, we always got to have a spider's nest. Let me shut well, you off on the back, back side now. Oh. I kind of hustle today. I got a few trinkets to box up and get into the post office. items I need to work on and I got an auction to go to today. Hopefully find some more good goodies. There's the back side of this. There's the other two caps that were under those uh, that bank of three. This is the bottom of that transformer. And here is uh, uh, right here is where you restrap um, this baby for 115 or you know 120 nowadays. Uh, this was set up for uh, 230 or 208. It's kind of a weird rigmarole. Anyway, you just jumper that. 
And there's also another transformer. It's where was that buried at? Uh, I can't remember right off the bat. It's too early in the morning. It's kind of interesting. This uh, transformer actually has screw terminals on it. It's so heavy. And here's where all the DC comes in to these pass transistors. There's the fan for the little wind tunnel. There's actually a little fan here just to kind of blow some more air. It probably provides a little bit of cooling for that transformer. And an annoying little tidbit, there's actually a circuit board kind of buried on the side of this wind tunnel. So uh, just annoying to have to if you have to work on that, you gotta knock this all loose and pull this all out. And if that other transformer is under here, you gotta you gotta take this uh, module up. And it's held in by some standoffs. There are four standoffs. You take that loose, and it flips out of the way. In the scheme of things, there really isn't a ton of stuff in here. I mean, it looks like a lot, but it's not. It just looks unwielding because it's so big. And like I mentioned in an earlier video, um, even if these don't work, there's a lot of decent stuff in here. These caps, there was five of them. There. 40,000 microfarad at 50 volt. Well, in the real world, there's that's probably $20 a cap. Now, I'm not sure how well these are. Um, there's some decent wiring in there if you want to play with something. And that transformer is definitely good property. And there's two meters on there. I believe um, that meter has a, the current meter has a shunt. So back in here, buried somewhere is the shunt for that. Uh, if you don't know what a shunt is, um, basically what that is is a multiplier for the meter. It's kind of a remote multiplier. Uh, normally current meters you have to run the current directly through the meter and a lot of them have an internal shunt. Well instead of running all that heavy wiring up to a remote location and then running it all back they uh, put a short little resistive block in a place, run the wiring to it and on, and then there's a pair of sensor leads that go to a, a meter remotely and they're, they're a lot skinnier and it saves you a little bit of wiring and one of the kind of fun things about that is you can uh, you can change that shunt pretty easily to kind of reprogram or repurpose the meter you can do that with about any little DC meter or AC meter. So that's all there is inside these. There's not a suit, like I said, there's not a super lot. Uh, this is kind of the driver module. There's some superfluous stuff in there. Basically, over here also is the DC rectifier. It's kind of on the end. That's all there is inside these. There's not a lot to really see other than it's kind of massive and kind of cool. It's probably pretty hard to make something that big, uh, compact, get it too unwielding and nobody will buy one from you. So I'm just going to temporarily screw this lid back on. Whatever. Roll this back over. Uh, let me just scooch out of the way here a little bit. Uh. There we go. Like I said, all the heavy work is done here. I don't know what that transformer weighs. A lot. Actually, it's relatively easy to take out. You release these four bolts, the thing kind of just slides up and you just jiggle it out of there. Actually, it's a lot easier to uh, loosen the four bolts and roll the thing over and let it fall out. These things are so big and so unwielding, I need to think of a 
clever way to move them around a little easier. I've actually got a guy going to come over and look at a couple, three of these today. He sounded very interested. So I'll take three down and a few more to go. That'll be great. That's the only, I guess, complaint I have about these. They're so big, they're hard to, they're hard to deal with and they're... Uh, Ooh. Excuse me. Makes them tough to store. So I need to get them out of here. I still got to figure out how I'm going to uh, install the one I want to keep on my bench. Actually, I think I'm going to. Uh, I think I'm going to put mine on the lower part of the bench. I was going to put it up on top, but I thought, you know, I'm going to kill myself wrestling it up there or I'm going to have to build a uh, Egyptian ramp to get it up there or get a hoist or I think what I'm going to do is just set it on its side and stick it on the bottom there and call it good. Actually one of the other problems I'm going to have is uh, just bringing the wiring up for the thing. I'm going to have to find some heavy wiring. I need to figure out some kind of a way to make a little kind of a, I don't know, I guess a terminal strip or something there. I don't know, this is where uh, paying attention out in the real world helps you out. I was trying to think, I was going to go buy some wire up at the uh, hardware store and I got up there doing something else and I was over there, over the section there looking at their wiring and man, the copper wiring has really gotten expensive. Not sure why, but uh, I decided to use my brain. It had to kind of get going first, and I went out in the, the garage there and was uh, snooping around. I found a box. It had like three or four sets of old jumper cables that I got at some estate sale, or probably actually I think those came from an auction. And what I did was I took one of the sets there. It's the clips aren't very good on it. There's nothing worse than a bad set of jumper cables. Um, the, but the wiring is quite long, so I took the clips off of the thing. The shielding and wiring, or the insulation of wire is just fine, so I'm going to uh, cut those off. Reuse those. I've got real sets of jumper cables, not those, you know, I have mixed emotions about sometimes about tools. I have, I, I get concerned about the longevity of uh, things in general, uh, built-in obsolescence. And there are two schools of thought on that kind of stuff. We're kind of getting away from the power supply here, but it's just, I don't know, food for thought. And I guess as long as you don't, as long as your expectations are met on an item, a tool, let's say, then you won't be disappointed. Um, if you buy something and expect it to stay around for the long haul and then it croaks or dies, you're going to get disappointed and that's that's when I always get a little annoyed. But if you buy something under the guise of it's disposable, that's a different story. And uh, I guess if you just want a cheap pair of jumper cables or yeah that's an example and don't care you know if they're if they're good for one or two times and then you know you throw them away then I guess you're not gonna get disappointed you know if I get a cheap set and just it sits under the seat in the truck or something no big deal but I, I use the jumper cables uh, a little bit more than one or two times a year, so I guess I, I've got a better set. I actually went and spent real cash money to buy a set at the auto parts store, which was probably a mistake. I should have went and bought, uh, if I had to do that over again, I'd go buy some probably welding cable, and you can buy jumper cable clamp-ins and just make my own.